Uh, thanks for being here on Monroe Day Eve. Uh, glad you could all make it. Uh, it's a pleasure on behalf of the Schumann School of Law to be able to say welcome. Most of you know who I am if you spend any time in the building. Uh, my name is Camille Cameron, I'm the Dean. For those of you who are visitors, welcome to our uh, building uh, and to the law school. We've got a very interesting topic for today. Um, I'm not going to uh, introduce our speaker because I'm going to turn things over to uh, Professor Devlin to do those honors um, and also to um, um, Daryl Pink, Professor Daryl Pink, who many of you know, to um, tell us a little bit about Ted Lickwire and the Lickwire Lecture, which of course uh, is um, uh, who we're honoring here today and the lecture is named for him. Who's, who's one of you? We have our script really well. <laughs> Uh, I'm pleased to tell you a little bit about the late Ted Wickwire. For the students in the room, the name Wickwire will mean most to you because of the Wickwire field. And it is the one and the same person. Uh, Ted Wickwire, uh, when he was a student uh, at this university in the 60s, was a true giant. Uh, not only was he an accomplished athlete and an accomplished academic, um, he graduated from uh, this law school. And he went on to have a prestigious legal career. And as part of that career, he made a strong commitment and devotion to building the notion that lawyers should actually have a code of conduct that they should be governed by. Uh, as hard as it is for us to believe today, in the 1990s, um, we didn't have, in the 1980s, we didn't have a code of conduct. And Ted, as a leader uh, in the Barrister Society, chaired the committee that resulted in the first written code of conduct in Nova Scotia. And he became president of the Barrister Society in 1991, and then tragically died that year uh, while in office. And the legacy that the society wanted to establish in his name was this lecture series, and this is the 29th. And over those years, we have not only had the giants of legal ethics, people like Monroe Friedman, Charles Wolfram, uh, Rebecca Sandefur uh, give these lectures. Rebecca was just last year named a McCarthy Fellow in the United States, which is equivalent to receiving the Nobel. Uh, we've had the giants in Canadian legal academic and ethics speak here as well. Um, uh, Harry Arthurs uh, gave a, a compelling lecture a number of years ago. Um, Adam Dodek, uh, Alice Woolley, now of the Alberta courts. Uh, so this lecture series, when you look through the 29 previous topics, uh, really indicate the depth and breadth of thinking now in Canada about legal ethics, and that was one of the purposes for this lecture series. Our guest today, uh, who Richard will introduce shortly, has previously participated uh, in this series with a colleague, uh, the late Justice Michelle Prue of the Courts of Quebec, uh, regarding the book they wrote on legal ethics and criminal law. Uh, so we're really pleased uh, to continue this lecture series uh, because of its continuing contribution uh, to legal ethics uh, in Canada. Thanks, Al. So I'll keep my remarks quite brief. Um, I'm going to introduce David. Uh, David graduated from Val in 1987, which is the same year as I started teaching here, so he actually never had the, the horror of experiencing me as a teacher. <coughs> David and I were once invited by the judges to have a debate with each other. As many of you want to start knocking down, dragging them out. It turned out that David's arguments were so fantastic, I agreed with him. Well, my arguments were so fantastic, he agreed with me, and the judge were very smart because it wasn't a debate then. And so we ended up writing co opting an article together where we came to the same conclusion, so that sort of didn't work as a plan. So mythology has it that in 87, when David graduated, two students shared all the prizes that year. It's 50 50. Well, not quite 50 50. David won one more prize than our former colleague, Ronaldo Murphy. And so he sort of wins that prize. He went on to clerk with the uh, Chief Justice Brian Dixon, Supreme Court of Canada. Spent 20 years as a defense lawyer and sort of has seen the world from that side. But then the last sort of five, seven years has went to the other side and has become a prosecutor specializing in appeals. So, so David knows both sides of the fence and he understands the complexity of the world of being from the lawyer. So he thought he'd be perfect to come today and share some thoughts on being a criminal lawyer, a hard gun, or a junkyard dog. And we also have a couple of leading criminal lawyers from Nova Scotia. Perhaps in the course of today's uh, questions, they may want to self-identify <laughs> with any of these categories or not. There may be some other possibilities. I'm going to say more about David. It's great to have you here. Thank you. So much.
Uh, thanks very much, Richard. It's, um, it's a real honor to uh, be speaking uh, at the Schulich School of Law today, not just because I went to school here, uh, but also because I, I think um, the topic of uh, legal professional responsibility um, has taken on a, a real importance and a real profile uh, from a public point of view in Canada, more so than, than ever before. And, and a big part of the sea change there has been the work that legal academics have, have done. Uh, there were very few academics who worked on legal ethics when I went to law school here in the 80s. Uh, one of them uh, taught here, uh, Brent Cotter, but uh, very few. Today, there, there are uh, many, um, and uh, Daryl mentioned some of them, and, 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 and two of the leaders in the field uh, are here teaching at Dow, uh, Richard and, and Professor Elaine Craig, and I've had the the uh, privilege of um, working with them and, and discussing issues with them over the last decade, and I know you're, you're very lucky to have leaders like that um, at the law school. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here um, sharing my thoughts at a public lecture about the role of criminal defense counsel, even if it means I've left the, the crocuses and the snowdrops of Vancouver uh, for a polar vortex. Um, I want to start then with uh, a short story about uh, a judicial appointment. Um, about a year ago, uh, the then Minister of Justice, uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould, appointed a Toronto lawyer named John Norris uh, to the Federal Court of Canada. And, and John Norris was a highly accomplished uh, advocate who'd been defense counsel for 25 years. And one of his uh, clients had been Omer Cotter, who I'm sure you've all heard about. He was a child soldier who was held in Guantanamo Bay, uh, pleaded uh, guilty to the murder of a U.S. soldier in contravention of the laws of war, uh, and uh, came back to Canada where he's uh, trying to overturn his conviction and is, is on bail. Now, when uh, John Norris was appointed, there was a certain amount of controversy in, in some quarters simply because he had represented Omar Cotter. Um, and the complaint that had the most attention, I, I think, uh, came from a conservative MP named Shannon Stubbs, and she tweeted that appointing a lawyer to the bench who had defended a confessed murder and terrorist is an utter embarrassment for Canada and, and the judicial system. So that's a fairly typical example of a lawyer being criticized uh, simply because they defended someone who was uh, accused of a crime. And the charge that's leveled uh, is that defense lawyers are, are doing ill, they're harming society uh, because they're helping criminals. And it's grounded in the notion that defense counsel lack an acceptable moral compass. Uh, they'll act for anyone charged with anything, and then once uh, they're paid, uh, they'll do whatever it takes to get the client off, doesn't matter what harm's caused to the victim or to society at large. And this is the critique of criminal defense counsel as a hired gun, someone who uh, will take on any cause no matter how despicable or, or a junkyard dog, uh, the, the ruthless attacker doesn't know any limits. Uh, does whatever it takes to get an acquittal. This afternoon, I want to uh, explain why this conception of a uh, criminal defense lawyer is flat out wrong. And my argument has uh, two main points. First, that criminal defense lawyers, far from causing harm to society, perform a vital, uh, beneficial role precisely because they act for people who've been accused of crimes and represent their interests as resolute advocates. The second part of my argument takes issue with the notion that defense counsel's duty to defend the client is all-encompassing and subject to no competing obligations. My pitch here is that defense lawyers have many competing duties that can significantly restrict what they can do on a client's behalf. What's more, defense counsel have to be personally, continually engaged in determining how these competing obligations play out in the circumstances. The right answer 
may not always be clear. There may be discretion in terms of what counsel can do. And the, the right answer, the right approach may differ from jurisdiction to dur jurisdiction. It may change over time. So in short, defense lawyers do good by taking on a partisan role in defending accused persons. But they don't act as hired guns or junkyard dogs for their clients. They have other masters as well, which makes the project of ethical defense lawyering much more complex, much more nuanced. Let me start then with the first prong of my argument, which is talking about defense counsel's special role in the justice system. Of course, that system's adversarial. It means that litigants are responsible for presenting their own case by bringing forward evidence, cross-examining the other side's witnesses, making arguments, etc. And partisanship is integral to the process. The decision on the disputed issues is made not by the parties, but by a neutral arbiter. In the criminal context, it's by a judge or a jury. Yet the system is tremendously complex. It's replete with lots of complicated rules about substance and procedure. And that complexity doesn't cause any uh, trouble for the state because the state uh, employs uh, comparatively well-financed professionals to investigate and to prosecute uh, criminal matters, the police and the crown. But the same can't be said for someone who's charged with a criminal offense. If self-represented, an accused person is always at a distinct disadvantage. And the disadvantage is especially acute uh, for the many accused who face uh, poverty, mental health and substance abuse uh, issues, uh, lack of education, legacy of past and ongoing discrimination, and other significant challenges. And of course, the stakes are high if convicted the accused faces the significant stigma of uh, being branded a criminal, the possible or even certain loss of liberty, and many other potentially adverse uh, knock-on effects such as a loss of employment, a damage to personal relationships, forfeiture of property, um, lack of in uh, inability to travel internationally, and so on. It follows that the accused needs the help of a lawyer to present the defense. And because that defense is presented within an adversarial process, the lawyer must loyally and fearlessly advocate for the accused's interest. Criminal defense counsel's role is therefore necessarily unabashedly partisan. In taking on this role, Defense counsel helps to ensure that both accused persons and the public can have confidence that the system is reaching accurate outcomes through a fair process. Defense counsel also promotes the autonomy and dignity of accused persons by facilitating their control of the case and acting as their story storytellers against the competing state narrative of criminality. So on this view, defense counsel does good simply by fighting for their client. The uh, virtue of the client's cause uh, isn't of much moment because it's the responsibility of others in the system to compete the alternative, uh, the alternate uh, narrative of events and to make the ultimate decision. This justification for defense counsel's partisan role is inextricably entwined with the constitutional rights that every accused person has in the criminal justice system. To begin with, the adversarial system and the accused's right to control the defense is itself uh, a fundamental principle of justice. The accused has other constitutional rights that are largely based on the view that counsel has to be acting uh, as a resolute advocate, the right to counsel at trial, the right to choice of counsel the right to counsel who doesn't have a conflict, the right to the ineffective assistance of counsel, the right to the protection of solicitor-client privilege. Just as important in defining defense counsel's role are long-standing due process rights that shape the very meaning of justice in the criminal setting. Every accused person, of course, is presumed innocent, which means that the Crown has the onus of proving guilt on the especially demanding standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. 
This constitutional guarantee goes hand in hand with the accused's right to make full answer and defense, which includes the right to test the reliability of the Crown case by cross-examining the Crown witnesses. There's also the privilege against self-incrimination, which precludes the state from forcing an accused to aid in building the prosecution case. And then finally, accused persons uh, will sometimes have the right to exclude evidence, that, evidence that's been obtained uh, by charter breach. For example, uh, a confession that was obtained uh, because of oppressive police techniques. These due process rights are animated by an unremitting desire to protect individuals from a powerful and sometimes overweening state. We want to limit the ability of the state to exercise power over us, and we fear that absence these rights, including the right to the assistance of loyal counsel, the state's representatives, and in particular the police, may misuse their power. This desire to overprotect accused persons in order to keep the state in check is unique to the criminal justice system. It means that truth finding isn't the only goal. It means that a pivotal aspect of defense counsel's job, as all the ethical codes expressly recognize, is to ensure that the state does not obtain a conviction absent proof beyond a reasonable doubt based on admissible and reliable evidence. And this duty applies regardless of what the client might have done. Even someone like Clifford Olson has a right to be defended by counsel. The uh, recent case of Groya and the Law Society of Upper Canada uh, not only endorses this view of criminal defense counsel's partisan role, it expressly recognizes that fearless advocacy by defense lawyers is itself a constitutionally protected imperative. I want to paraphrase quite closely something the majority said in Groya, this is from Mr. Justice Maldiver, uh, criminal defense lawyers are the final frontier between the accused and the power of the state. They're regularly called on to make submissions on behalf of their clients that are unpopular and at times uncomfortable. Doing so may be met with harsh criticism from the public, but defense counsel must stand resolute in the face of this adversity by continuing to advocate for the client despite popular opinion to the contrary. I believe that this view of criminal defense counsel's partisan role makes sense, that it's justifiable, but there's a danger in, in oversimplifying uh, so as to glorify defense counsel as, as clients a moral instrument, an instrument uh, whose single-minded duty is to push the client's cause forward no matter what. And this completely client-centered account of defense counsel role uh, buys into the conception of lawyers as hired guns and junkyard dogs. In fact, some criminal lawyers proudly brand themselves that way in an effort to attract clients. But the, the purely client-focused conception of criminal defense counsel's mission um, is unconvincing, I say, for uh, several reasons. Number one, it fails to acknowledge that professional ethics often require defense lawyers to promote values other than the client's best interests. Uh, second, it portrays the lawyer as an automaton. It fails to describe the extent to which defense counsel is actively engaged on an ongoing basis in making ethical decisions. And third, this purely client-centered approach ignores the extent to which legal ethics can change over time and from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. I'm going to spend uh, the rest of my talk looking at a number of examples of instances where values other than the client's best interests form a part of defense counsel's ethics. And to start, I want to uh, make the point that Although defense counsel has to act as partisan advocate for the accused, the case law, the ethical codes, 
all recognize that council simultaneously owes what we've often referred to as duties to the administration of, of justice. And many of these duties flow from the need to protect the integrity of the justice system. Conduct that undermines the truth-seeking goal of that system, conduct that undermines the fairness of the system is unacceptable. And so is conduct that causes undue harm to other justice system participants. Indeed, there's a parallel between the need for defense counsel to balance her duty as an advocate with obligations to the administration of justice and the way in which Crown Counsel's duty as Minister of Justice tempers her role as an advocate. Of course, the, the calibration of the balancing exercise isn't exactly the same because Defense Counsel has to give uh, more weight to uh, partisanship. But the idea of advocacy being tempered by countervailing duties to the integrity of the system uh, not only applies to Crown Counsel, it applies to defense lawyers as well. Perhaps the most often uh, mentioned uh, duty that lawyers owe to the administration of justice is the duty not to knowingly mislead the court. And this is an overriding duty. It always trumps defense counsel's duty to advance the client's defense. But let me unpack the concept a bit because it's, it's simple to state but not always so straightforward uh, to apply. The duty not to mislead the court doesn't mean that defense counsel must come to her own determination as to where the truth lies in the same way that a, a, a judge or a jury would. That would be to undermine defense counsel's role as part of a partisan advocate. That would risk grave injustice. And we see an example of counsel going wrong in a Quebec case called Delisle, where a conviction was overturned on appeal after defense counsel refused to locate an alibi witness because counsel on his own assessment of the case had determined that the client wasn't telling the truth about being innocent. The Court of Appeal held that defense counsel had given ineffective assistance because he had acted more as judge than as a resolute advocate. So when does a lawyer truly know that evidence is false so as to trigger this rule prohibiting misleading the court? In my view, the lawyer must reach an irresistible conclusion that the evidence is false based on a criminal standard of proof, and this conclusion must be one that not even a resolute but honest partisan could deny. Now, the irresistible conclusion test has been adopted or endorsed by the Supreme Court of Canada in a case called Uvaraja. It will certainly be met where the client makes a, a clear and convincing admission of guilt to the lawyer. But otherwise, it will be difficult to satisfy because remember, counsel's not assessing whether the evidence is false as if a judge hearing the case, rather, counsel's adopting a very different mindset, the mindset of the resolute but honest partisan. This standard can be challenging to apply. Reasonable lawyers may disagree as to whether it's met on a particular set of facts. Many defense lawyers may be exceedingly reluctant to accept that this standard is, is met absent a reliable confession from the client. And even where the lawyer has received that sort of confession from the client, there can be nuances as to how the duty to not mislead the court applies in a particular case. The ethical codes uh, all provide that while defense counsel who receives an admission of guilt from a client can't set up an affirmative defense inconsistent with this knowledge, such as by calling an alibi, counsel is nonetheless entitled to test the evidence given by each Crown witness and to argue that the evidence taken as a whole is insufficient to prove guilt on the criminal standard. What are the limits of testing the evidence of a witness when counsel knows that the client's guilty? Well, the Supreme Court of Canada clarified this point in a case called Little, holding that defense counsel cannot put a suggestion to a witness in cross-examination that counsel knows 
is false. That would go beyond what's permitted in testing the evidence of a Crown witness. But it doesn't completely tie the lawyer's hands in defending the client. And a great example of how this limitation does and doesn't apply is seen in a British Columbia case uh, called Lee. And in Lee, the accused had confessed to his lawyer to committing uh, the charged robbery of a jewelry store. And the Crown called the two store clerks to testify, and they identified the accused as, as the culprit. And in line with the holding in Little, the uh, British Columbia Court of Appeal held that given the lawyer's knowledge that his client was guilty, the lawyer couldn't put to the clerks in cross-examination that they were actually wrong in identifying his client as the perpetrator. But the court ruled that counsel could properly test the strength of the Crown case by bringing out truthful evidence that might help raise a reasonable doubt as to the reliability of the clerk's identification evidence. So the court said it was proper for defense counsel to have cross-examined the clerks to elicit from them that they weren't sure of their identification and to highlight truthful elements of their testimony that might put into question uh, its reliability, such as the fact that they only had a brief look at the perpetrator. The court even said that it was okay for defense counsel to elicit truthful evidence from a police witness about the attributes of the accused that were inconsistent with descriptions that the perpetrator had provided about or rather, the uh, clerks had provided about the perpetrator, such as hairstyle uh, at the time and proficiency of English. So remember, counsel wasn't eliciting any of this evidence, uh, any evidence that counsel knew to be false. And at the end of the case, counsel wasn't saying to the jury that the client was innocent. Rather, counsel was bringing out truthful evidence and using it only to suggest to the jury that the Crown hadn't met its onus of proving guilt on the stringent standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But not all defense lawyers agree on how far a lawyer can go in challenging the Crown case where the client has privately admitted guilt. For instance, some defense lawyers may refuse to cross-examine a witness that they know to be truthful by casting aspersions on that witness's character in order to suggest not that there exists a reasonable doubt as to whether the witness is mistaken, like in the Lee case, but rather to suggest that there exists a reasonable doubt as to whether the witness is lying. So the lawyer may be able to bring out truthful evidence that the witness has a possible motive to lie, maybe a criminal record for an offense of dishonesty, perhaps has given a prior inconsistent statement. Relying on that sort of truthful evidence to suggest that there exists a reasonable doubt as to whether the witness is lying creates, I would suggest, a greater risk of harm to the witness's reputation than is the case where the lawyer relies on truthful evidence to argue that there's a reasonable doubt as to whether the witness is mistaken. And in some instances, like sexual assault cases, cross-examining to impeach the character of a witness the counsel knows to be truthful can cause harm to broader societal interests, and in particular, uh, the need to encourage sexual assault complainants to come forward to report the victimization. Now, there's nothing in the ethical codes that states that cross-examination that attempts to re raise a reasonable doubt by impeaching a witness's character, who counsel knows to be truthful, is improper. Nothing in the codes that especially says that that's wrong. And some lawyers would undoubtedly be prepared to carry out that cross-examination. But others might refuse to do it because of the concerns that I've mentioned. And in my view, neither position is necessarily unethical, although the lawyer who's not going to carry out that cross-examination will have to tell the accused promptly. we we'll move on to another example of a limitation on criminal defense counsel's partisanship, and it's uh, related to the restric restrictions that uh, apply to handling disclosure materials. These are the materials that the police create in investigating an offense, and then they're passed on to defense counsel who uses them to help make full answer defense. And it used to be 
that defense counsel didn't get much in the way of disclosure in many cases. But in 1991, the Supreme Court of Canada recognized a broad right to disclosure in a case called Stinchcomb. And in the years after Stinchcomb, uh, the amount of disclosure uh, increased exponentially. Uh, there was almost too much of it. Um, and uh, technology for creating records um, improved. Uh, criminal cases became more complex. But uh, it became clear that disclosure materials also engaged third-party privacy interests. Uh, so, for example, disclosure may have witness statements where witnesses are talking about highly personal matters. They may be medical records, financial records, private communications that have been intercepted, and so on. The right of the accused to make full answer in defense is going to override those privacy interests so that the accused will get disclosure. And, and if the information in the disclosure is admissible, the accused uh, can put it into evidence at trial. But using the disclosure for a purpose other than making full answer in defense, in the case to which it relates, can create real harm. And in the years following the Stinchcomb decision, there was a, a great deal of uncertainty in terms of what was acceptable for criminal lawyers to do in this area. And certainly some criminal lawyers were um, passing disclosure around pretty freely. Um, consider the example of a lawyer who gives disclosure to the client's family, and then the family posts parts of the disclosure on social media, and it causes acute embarrassment or distress for a witness. Um, that sort of misuse of disclosure may lead to a witness uh, being threatened, may lead to a witness suffering physical harm, uh, and the witness may also be less willing to cooperate with the police or the Crown, which causes harm to the administration of justice. So these harms are, are harms that may actually inure to the benefit of the accused in a particular case, but they undermine the proper functioning of the justice system. And as a result, in 1993, uh, the influential Martin Report expressed the view that defense counsel has an ethical duty not to use disclosure or the information in it for any purpose other than to make full answer in defense in the particular case in which it was disclosed. That Martin Report uh, took, took, a, it took a long time for that position to work its way through the criminal bar. But I think in most places in Canada now, it's accepted as the proper approach. And in some jurisdictions, uh, the Crown includes this restriction uh, as an express undertaking so that defense counsel has to agree to it before accepting the disclosure materials. Uh, in other jurisdictions like British Columbia, the courts have recognized an implied undertaking that works to the same effect. Uh, there may be still other jurisdictions in Canada where neither an express or an implied undertaking is used, but I would say in those jurisdictions there'll be a consensus in the criminal bar generally as to the restrictions on the use of disclosure. Counsel who misuse disclosure face serious repercussions. There's a case in Ontario called Amber where parts of the disclosure given to defense counsel have been redacted by the Crown. Uh, defense counsel wanted to see what was behind those redactions, legitimately believed that the information would be helpful to the defense, but instead of bringing a court application to get that remedy, he posted the disclosure on his website and asked if anyone had software that could remove the redactions. Um, he breached the express undertaking he had given to the Crown. He breached his client's uh, right to confidentiality with respect to that disclosure, uh, and he was not surprisingly disciplined by the Law Society and sued civilly by his client uh, and ended up settling out of court. In fact, for a time, this counsel uh, was not allowed to receive any disclosure to review it. He had to go to the Crown's office and, and read it over by himself in an office. Defense counsel can face, um, and, and that's an obvious case of misuse, but there, there are other cases where defense counsel's handling of disclosure, what's proper, what's not proper, isn't so obvious. And one area where this can be the case is providing copies of disclosure to the client. Because giving the client copies can help the client's understanding of the case. Uh, it, it's an easy way to impart the information and it makes it easier for 
counsel to get instructions. Not giving the client copies can make all of those things difficult, uh, and it can also upset the client uh, if the client wants copies and can cause friction in the relationship. Nonetheless, in my view, there will be instances where defense counsel has an ethical duty to take uh, steps to limit clients' access to disclosure. Now, in, in most cases, it's enough to give the client copies and say, uh, this information can only be used for the purposes of your defense. But counsel may have reasonable, legitimate suspicion that the client uh, is going to misuse that disclosure. If that suspicion can't be alleviated sufficiently, then it may be uh, justifiable for the lawyer to refuse to give copies to the client, to instead look for other alternatives, such as the client coming to counsel's office uh, to review the materials. Nonetheless, uh, two counsel looking at the same fact situation may come reasonably to different conclusions as to uh, whether there's a legitimate concern, or, or if there is a legitimate concern, how it should be handled. So there may be more than one acceptable response to an ethical issue and counsel may have some discretion in determining what that response should be. Another uh, example of a restriction on counsel uh, that can um, run counter to uh, the duty of resolute advocacy is the restriction against eliciting inadmissible evidence from a witness. The reason why this is unethical is that the rules of evidence aim to uh, promote justice by ensuring that the information that goes in front of the fact finder is uh, relevant and not unduly prejudicial. Uh, and ignoring a rule of admissibility therefore risks subverting trial fairness. It may lead to uh, an inaccurate result. So it's unethical to ask a witness a question that the lawyer knows will elicit inadmissible testimony, even though that evidence might help the lawyer's client. And it's no answer to say that, well, it's the responsibility of opposing counsel to raise the objection. Opposing counsel may, may be asleep at the wheel and, and not object or may object too late after the answer has been given. Uh, simply asking the question uh, may cause some harm uh, in certain circumstances. And in fact, in recent years, I've noticed uh, more and more case law that holds that if a lawyer has a reasonable basis to conclude that there's going to be an objection to evidence, the lawyer should alert opposing counsel uh, to the intention to, uh, the intention to elicit that evidence in advance so that it can be dealt with in front of the trial judge and a, a ruling can be obtained rather than simply uh, asking the question. Once again, this is an instance where reasonable lawyers may disagree as to whether there exists a sufficient basis to believe that an objection may arise so as to sort of trigger a duty to give some forewarning to opposing counsel. Uh, in, in my view, uh, regardless, lawyers should be uh, aware of the obligation on this point, and I think prudent counsel will uh, exercise caution and give uh, their opponent uh, uh, notice. Frivolous applications. Um, in many criminal cases, the defense will bring an application before the trial proper in order to try to exclude uh, crown evidence. But bringing frivolous applications, and I, I mean applications that have absolutely no chance of success, that's harmful to the justice system. It wastes valuable resources. It causes uh, delay. Uh, acceptance of a prohibition against defense counsel bringing frivolous applications has gained significant traction in the last 10 years. There's an influential report on uh, large complex trials that was authored by uh, former Ontario Chief Justice Patrick Lesage and then uh, U of T Professor Michael Code that recognized this ethical duty. Uh, same ethical duty was recognized by Mr. Justice Maldever when he was on the Ontario Court of Appeal in a rather controversial speech that he gave to the uh, Ontario Criminal Lawyers Association in the early 2000s. And I would suggest that the duty uh, not to bring a frivolous application has 
uh, been implicitly recognized by the Supreme Court of Canada in the Cody case. Uh, there are some comments there that uh, seem to uh, take this view, for example, for example, a reference to defense counsel having an obligation to use court time efficiently. However, um, launching a frivolous application, we may say, well, wh why would anyone do that anyway? There's no point to it. Sometimes it can actually help defense counsel's client because it may allow the defense to obtain some uh, genuine collateral benefits. And this is what happened in a murder case uh, in Ontario called Elliott, where defense counsel brought multiple uh, frivolous applications that took up months and months of court time uh, and ended up completely sidetracking uh, the trial. Uh, the Ontario Court of Appeal recognized that bringing those applications may have gained the accused some real collateral benefits, for example, by um, creating leverage in an attempt to get a better plea deal from the Crown. But the Court of Appeal nonetheless held that bringing a frivolous application to obtain collateral benefits was deplorable. Uh, and I agree with that conclusion. I would say counsel shouldn't be misusing the legal process by bringing a hopeless application as a tool to essentially extort benefits to which the client's not entitled. But I want to add two important caveats to, to the prohibition on frivolous applications. The first one is that the prohibition doesn't prevent defense counsel from forcing the Crown to prove every element of the offense charged at trial. The accused has a constitutional right to plead not guilty, a constitutional right to force the Crown to prove its case on the criminal standard. This is very different from a pretrial application where the defense bears the burden of proof. Second, determining whether an application is frivolous isn't always easy. Substantial review of the facts and the law is necessary, and different lawyers may reasonably come to different conclusions as to whether an application has sufficient merit to justify it being brought. Another area where defense counsel uh, faces restrictions that can uh, temper what counsel can do for the client uh, concerns dealing with witnesses outside of the court. And there are many, many restrictions uh, that govern counsel in this regard. I'm just going to mention a few of them. Uh, first, uh, ethical codes provide that in contacting a witness, the lawyer must disclose uh, her own interest in the case. And the codes also state that a lawyer can't deal with anyone in bad faith and can't encourage or, or assist in any dishonest conduct. Now these provisions mean that when a lawyer approaches uh, a witness, say to try to get uh, information on the client's behalf prior to trial, that lawyer has to explain up front the nature of the matter, who the lawyer is acting for, and what the lawyer's interest in the case is. In my view, these provisions also mean that neither defense counsel nor defense counsel's agent can pretend to be someone else to trick a witness into speaking with them, for example, by adopting another persona uh, on social media. It doesn't matter that doing this might be legal. It doesn't matter that doing this uh, is, is for a legitimate cause in the sense of assisting the client in making full answer in defense. It may well be that some defense lawyers disagree with, with the view that I've just taken. They may say that sting operations that are directed at Crown witnesses are fair game. And I suppose the argument would be that there's an implicit exception uh, to the ethical code rules that allow lawyers to engage in lawful subterfuge when it's aimed at a witness, provided the lawyer reasonably believes that doing so may uncover a falsehood. And in fact, in some jurisdictions in the United States, in Oregon's the, the best known example, uh, there is a, an exception in the ethical codes that actually allows a lawyer to engage in lawful covert activity for this sort of purpose. I'm going to move on to um, a, a very different topic. Um, and it deals with uh, guilty pleas 
for clients who privately uh, maintained a lawyer that they're innocent. Now, uh, a lot of the vast majority of criminal cases are, are dealt with by guilty plea. And, and often that's because the Crown case is strong. Uh, it's also uh, partly because if an accused pleads guilty, um, they usually get a lesser sentence because the guilty plea is seen as an expression of remorse. It's mitigating for that reason. Uh, and it also avoids the need to expend resources uh, on a trial. It's mitigating for that uh, additional reason. Uh, and sometimes a client will tell uh, defense counsel that they want to plead guilty, and then in the same breath they'll say that they're innocent. And, and I, I would say this happens to every defense counsel uh, quite often. Um, if the client is refusing to admit guilt in open court, then it's clear counsel can't act on the guilty plea because a judge won't accept a guilty plea from a client who expressly uh, claims innocence in the courtroom. But what if the client agrees to admit guilt in court uh, and only in private insists on maintaining innocence? The question arises, can defense counsel act on the guilty plea in these circumstances? It's easy to think of a scenario where it makes sense, some sense, for counsel to be able to act on this sort of guilty plea. Take the case of an offense that's quite minor, a client who has a long criminal record and has no chance of getting bail. For that client, a guilty plea will mean a reduced sentence. Uh, waiting to get a trial date while staying in jail will almost certainly mean a longer sentence, even if the client is acquitted. Now, of course, it's, it's not a sentence in that case, uh, but it's still jail time. And for a client who already has a long criminal record, there's, there's no real difference. And an additional conviction by pleading guilty is no big deal. So that's a scenario where uh, there are some reasons I can think of why uh, counsel might say, yeah, uh, I'm prepared to, to uh, act on the guilty plea in that circumstance. On the other hand, there are uh, several um, known uh, wrongful convictions in Canada that have occurred where defense lawyers have acted on guilty pleas for clients who privately maintain innocence. So there's a concern that a lawyer acting in that sort of circumstance may be helping to create an injustice. A different sort of objection is that acting on the guilty plea in these circumstances is to mislead the court because the judge will view the guilty plea as an expression of remorse and yet the lawyer knows that the client's not remorseful because the client is in fact privately maintaining innocence. What do the rules of professional conduct say about this? Well, they, they don't provide a, a, a completely clear answer. They talk about uh, counsel only being able to uh, make a plea agreement with the Crown if the client is prepared to admit the necessary factual and mental elements of the offense charged. But arguably this wording doesn't prevent counsel from acting on a guilty plea for a client who privately maintains innocence provided the client is prepared to admit the elements of the offense in open court. Counsel can do that and avoid misleading the court, arguably, by not making the submission that the guilty plea is an expression of remorse. And as for the concern about wrongful convictions, one could say, well, counsel can alleviate that problem by only acting on the guilty plea if they're satisfied that there's a very strong Crown case. Having said all that, uh, in Canada, uh, there are some trial-level decisions that say that a lawyer shouldn't be acting on a guilty plea if the client is privately maintaining innocence. And I would suggest that most criminal counsel in uh, defense counsel in Canada would take the same view. Can't act in that circumstance. This is an interesting area in, in that other jurisdictions take different views uh, of, of this ethical dilemma. So for example, in uh, England and Wales, uh, the law is that a lawyer can act on a guilty plea for a client who privately maintains innocence provided a number of preconditions are met. For example, the client has to be told that he shouldn't be pleading 
guilty, if he's innocent, the client has to be told that the lawyer can't uh, submit to the judge that the client is expressing remorse and, and so on. Um, in the United States, there's a, a different approach that's taken. Um, counsel can act on what's known as an Alford plea that's named after the leading case in the area. And on an Alford plea, uh, the client pleads guilty, but then expressly maintains innocence in open court, and the judge can enter a conviction provided uh, the judge is satisfied that there's a strong factual basis to hold um, the accused or defendant guilty. I don't know if any of you have heard of the West Memphis Three um, uh, involved uh, some uh, young men or boys in uh, West Memphis who were convicted, I think in the 80s, and there's a, a number of documentaries about them. Uh, they were uh, potentially exonerated a few years ago, but the only way they could get out of jail was, was to plead guilty through the, the Alford process, and it was uh, quite controversial at the time. Um, finally, in Ontario, w there's been a, a, another approach that's been taken to this, this issue, uh, endorsed by the Ontario Court of Appeal, and on this process, the client um, who wants to plead guilty but is privately maintained in innocence um, pleads not guilty, but then uh, the defense allows the Crown to prove its case by submitting a written statement to the court. No, no evidence called other than this piece of paper. And then the defense joins the Crown in asking the trial judge to convict the accused based on that written statement. At the sentencing hearing, the defense doesn't say that the client's expressing remorse. He, he's not. He's pleaded uh, not guilty. But the client will get it some discount on the sentence because uh, taking this approach has uh, avoided the need uh, for a trial. And this is similar to what's known in the United States as a no low contendere or no contest plea. Uh, it's had some uptake in Ontario um, since the uh, case where it was first endorsed. Uh, I don't know that it's been used in the rest of Canada. I know certainly in British Columbia when I talk to lawyers um, I get the feeling that they, they would not uh, participate in this sort of uh, process. A final um, example of restrictions on defense counsel uh, in acting for a client involves handling physical evidence of a crime. Um, one of the most notorious and challenging ethical issues uh, arising in Canada in the last 25 years, I would say, uh, and the clash of principles here uh, is obvious. If the lawyer uh, is to put the client's defense forward, it may be necessary to take physical evidence of a crime, look at it, maybe keep it to, to use it at trial. On the other hand, if that's incriminating physical evidence that the, the police would want for their investigation, uh, it may deny the police and the Crown access to that evidence. That could be seen to, to do an injustice. And this is what happened in uh, the infamous Ken Murray case. Uh, in 1993, lawyer Ken Murray uh, followed his client Paul Bernardo's instructions to remove videotapes from Bernardo's house following a 71-day police search. Uh, the tapes have been hidden above a pot light, and they contained uh, uh, depictions of Bernardo and his wife, Carla Homolka, uh, grossly sexually assaulting uh, the two girls that Bernardo would soon be charged with murdering. Um, the tapes were hugely incriminating for Bernardo. They would have substantially strengthened the Crown's case, and if the Crown had have had them, the Crown would not have done a plea deal with Carla Homolka. Uh, instead, they would have uh, charged her with Paul Bernardo um, with first-degree murder. Uh, Ken Murray, the lawyer, hung on to those tapes uh, for 17 months. They only came to light when he tried to get off the record. He was charged with obstructing justice for keeping the tapes, and he only barely escaped conviction, uh, the reason being that the trial judge held that in the absence of a clear prohibition on 
Murray's conduct, there was a reasonable doubt as to whether he intended to obstruct justice by keeping those tapes. But the trial judge made clear that in the future, any lawyer who kept possession of evidence that overwhelmingly implicated the client in a crime would be guilty of obstructing justice. Now, at the time of the Murray case, there was no uh, ethical code rule dealing with this issue, or at least not one that gave any guidance to counsel. Um, and uh, the Murray case actually criticized the Ontario uh, Law Society of Upper Canada for the lack of a rule. So the Law Society of Upper Canada, after the case had ended, struck a committee to draft a rule. Uh, and uh, the majority of that committee supported a rule uh, that would permit lawyers to handle physical evidence of a crime for their clients in certain restricted circumstances. For example, where um, keeping that evidence and using it at trial would be necessary to prevent a miscarriage of justice. Uh, the majority of the committee's proposed rule also would allow counsel to return the physical evidence back to its source in some circumstances if having looked at the evidence they determined that it wasn't going to help the defense. But there were dissenting members on, on that committee and they favored a rule uh, that was much narrower and more categorical. Um, if a lawyer came into possession of physical evidence under their proposed rule, in every circumstance, the lawyer would have to turn the evidence over to the police or the Crown, although they would do it an anonymously. Um, the Law Society of Upper Canada ultimately uh, decided to do nothing. Uh, the, no rule was adopted. Uh, a similar attempt, I believe, was made in, in Nova Scotia shortly after and sort of came to the, the same end. Um, however, the Federation of Law Societies of Canada in their model code, which was adopted by many provinces starting in 2011 or so, uh, did contain uh, a modest rule addressing the handling of physical evidence of a crime. And uh, this rule was adopted by a number of law societies in Canada, but not by some of the larger ones like BC and Ontario and Alberta. Then in 2014, the Federation drafted a new rule, one that was more comprehensive, one that offered more guidance, and that rule has been adopted by most law societies, including in this province. Uh, the new rule starts out with a basic prohibition against lawyers uh, concealing, destroying, or altering uh, incriminating physical evidence. Uh, but the rule acknowledges that the restriction doesn't apply to evidence that's wholly exculp exculpatory. Crucially, the rule says that a lawyer who comes into possession of incriminating physical evidence uh, must consider his or her options, and then some options, three options are set out. One of them is to uh, turn the item over to the police anonymously. A second one is to turn the item over to the court. And the third one is for the lawyer to tell the Crown that they have possession of the item. In most provinces, a big question or uh, a mark exists as to whether the lawyer can ever take possession and then return it to its source, uh, the item to its source. In British Columbia, the rule has been uh, added to a bit and it expressly includes that return to source as, as an option. I've really uh, just scratched the surface of, of this issue, but I want to make a last point which is that when lawyers uh, were first debating, not first debating, but when they were really into the discussion of this issue when the Murray case happened uh, uh, and was first revealed in the early 1990s, they were mostly talking about corporeal items like the, the, the smoking gun, they would say, or the bloody shirt or the videotape in the Murray case. Um, but with the proliferation of electronic media, um, this issue comes up way more often than it ever did. And what's more, because electronic files can be copied, there may be ways for lawyers to take possession of incriminating physical evidence uh, without uh, denying the police or the Crown access to that same evidence, assuming that, let's say, electronic copies can be made without altering the, the so-called original and assuming that possession of that copy isn't illegal in itself. To sum up, this is an excellent example of an area of ethics 
uh, where we've seen substantial change over the years, in part because the Murray case gave the profession such a, a black eye that law societies really took an interest in trying to work on a solution. But also, I would say we've seen changes or, or efforts to deal with this issue, in part because of uh, changes in technology. It remains an area where there is some, some uncertainty as to what lawyers should do. Um, and the lawyer who encounters physical evidence of a crime may therefore have uh, some options in determining where the right balance lies uh, between the obligation to the client and the obligation to the administration of justice. I've um, talked then about a number of instances where uh, duties to the administration of justice restrict what a lawyer can do in advocating for the client. Um, there are many other examples I could give, but I, I want to um, mention the argument that sometimes made, which is that yes, these restrictions exist, but defense lawyers must always adopt the most client friendly view of whether and to what extent the restrictions apply. And the arguments made that adopting the most client friendly view of the restrictions is necessary because of the duty of loyalty to the client. And it's also sometimes said, and this is the race to the bottom argument, that clients are only going to retain lawyers who will take the least restrictive view of any duty that might temper what the lawyer can do to help the client. Uh, so unless lawyers adopt that position, they're not going to get any business. These arguments are rejected by the vast majority of criminal lawyers, and rightly so. For one thing, there's no... Uh, ethical principle that requires counsel to take the least restrictive view of their duties to the administration of justice. And uh, moreover, the lawyer who skates as close to the line as possible in terms of the divide between ethical and, and unethical behavior is playing a very dangerous game because the risk is great that at some point, maybe at many points, the lawyer is going to skate over the line uh, with significant adverse consequences, not only to the justice system, but to the lawyer himself or herself. A court may order that the lawyer pay costs of a criminal proceeding because of unethical conduct, may cite the lawyer in contempt. Uh, an aggrieved client may uh, argue that the lawyer is given ineffective assistance of counsel on appeal or may sue the client civilly. The law society may bring discipline proceedings, and, and most seriously, the lawyer may be charged criminally. Uh, but uh, more even than any of these things, the lawyer who habitually state, skates close to the line is going to gain a bad reputation within the legal community. The criminal bar is uh, small and close-knit in most jurisdictions. The lawyer who plays fast and loose with the rules is going to be less trusted by prosecutors, less trusted by trial judges. That's going to have a negative impact on the lawyer's practice, and there will, I would suggest, always be a knock-on negative effect on the lawyer's clients. So let me conclude with, with a, a wrap-up. Um, criminal lawyers shouldn't be attacked simply because they act for people who may have done horrible things. The adver adversarial system requires defense lawyers to act in their clients' best interests. We've seen, though, that defense lawyers are subject to a host of ethical duties that limit what they can do for their clients. And they must constantly be engaged in assessing whether and to what extent those countervailing obligations restrain what they can do as resolute advocates. The dilemmas will arise the proper response is not always clear, and defense lawyers may have a discretion regarding what action they can take. Ethical criminal defense lawyering is therefore, I would say, a personal enterprise. And I mean personal in the sense that the lawyer must be guided by her own reasonable, considered assessment of the proper balance to strike between both resolute advocate obligations to protect the integrity of the 
the administration of justice. When the ethical dilemma is a tough one, the lawyer should always get advice from another trusted source, whether it's an advisory uh, line at a law society or senior respected uh, counsel to make sure that the, the course of action taken is the best one. And finally, uh, many of the examples I've talked about today involve areas where ethical obligations have changed over time or differ somewhat from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And I would say that this illustrates that the extent to which the duty of resolute advocacy must give way to counsel's uh, obligations, sorry, must give way to counsel's obligations to the administration of justice and how it must do so isn't written in stone. It's not preordained. Uh, rather, what constitutes ethical conduct is uh, the product of a constellation of living, evolving forces like law society regulation, including ethical codes, case law, academic <coughs> commentary, training in law schools, <coughs> professional cultures within a jurisdiction, within a law firm, societal changes that impact what lawyers can do, and how they do it, and so on. Defense lawyers are part of this constellation constantly evolving forces that make up ethical behavior. Uh, they do good by playing a partisan role in the adversarial system. They help the disadvantaged often when no one else will. They ensure that the justice system is reliable and fair. They guard against miscarriages of justice and they respect and uphold the integrity of the administration of justice. Defense lawyers are not, therefore, hired guns and junkyard dogs to be exoriated. They are champions of justice, and they should be celebrated. Uh, yeah, yes, I think there's no doubt that that there is, and and um, as, as you know, um, the ethical rules themselves have uh, 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 interdictions against uh, harassing, vexatious cross examination, overly repetitive cross examination. Lots of case law says that that's improper. Uh, I guess the the difficult. Uh, point is to know where and when the line is crossed uh, to be able to identify that point. Obviously, there, there's going to be s some room for disagreement, but also I think there's often a difficulty in that, um, you know, perhaps the Crown isn't objecting, perhaps defense counsel is going too far, perhaps a, a judge isn't intervening when it's clear that. Uh, that the cross-examination is simply bullying, vexatious, harassing. It's not doing anything to ad legitimately advance uh, the client's cause. I mean, interestingly, uh, I, th I think many all good lawyers would say that that sort of cross-examination is not to the client's advantage. It's exactly the, the opposite, and, and yet it, um, it, it does happen. Unfortunately. Do you think there's a role for judges to be more proactive in instructing lawyers as to how they should conduct cross examination in a sense before it starts? To sort of say that I mean, I, these are difficult cases and I want to remind counsel 
that there are limits on your content. Judges are often obviously reluctant to sort of enter the arena, but I'm wondering if there is a greater responsibility on the judiciary to step up in these issues. I, I don't know that there, I don't think there'd be anything um, uh, terribly wrong with making that comment. I would suspect that few judges would would do that. I think they'd many judges would be concerned that making that comment uh, would be perceived as as a slight against defense counsel, sort of a almost a an expectation that defense counsel was going to do something wrong. Having said that, I under, I understand that's that's not what you're suggesting, and and I think if framed uh, in a respectful uh, way, that that sort of comment would be would be fine. I mean, traditionally judges have been uh, terribly concerned about appearing to be biased and entering the fray, and and that has changed um, very much. And and I, I think the people who are in uh, Joel's class maybe have read the Groya case. I mean, you could like in the Gro like Groya would not happen today because that's a case where the judge sat back and didn't do anything when. Defense counsel was making all these crazy arguments. T today, the the judge would say, "But stop!" You know, it would be all over with uh, within uh, a few minutes of that happening, or within a few times of Goya making those arguments. And I think the same approach, hopefully, is starting to happen more with intervening when cross examination is going off the rails. But you know, I was re I don't know if this is true, but I was reading. Uh, I think in one paper today or yesterday uh, that the Alberta Court of Appeal overturned a decision in a sexual assault case because the judge was seen to be intervening too much during the cross-examination and that was perceived as helping the accused and, and being biased. So um, it, it's, a, it's a hard uh, road to, to tread, but I think judges have to be able to be prepared to get engaged when, when there's a need to do it. David, a comment. Um, excessive partisanship um, doesn't is not exclusive to criminal law. There's currently a case um, where a major decision was made this week in a civil matter in Nova Scotia, uh, where the amount of issue was half a million dollars and the legal fees exceeded half a million dollars. And one of the counsel is being considered before the courts with regard to excessive partisanship that drove the costs. So many of these issues. Although we're focusing on criminal law, also applying to the ethics of advocacy in civil cases, even though there are a much stronger set of civil procedure rules, which government lawyers do, but they can even in law. Sure. Well, and you know, I practiced criminal law for um, a couple of, sorry, civil law for a couple of years, and I certainly found it was a lot more partisan than than criminal law in terms of the the. Uh, procedures and, and techniques used by opposing counsel, the tone of, of letters and uh, communications. So, uh, you know, uh, criminal law is, is a cakewalk compared to that. Yeah. I mean, just give your thoughts on the English cadre rule and how that compares with the Canadian freedom of choice on the defense counsel's part. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm not sure to what I, I have this feeling that maybe the cab rank rule is lo it losing its allure in in England, and maybe it's been uh, uh, pulled back a little bit. My sense was that the cab rank rule, would, the the idea that that a lawyer has to take every client who comes in to see them, as long you know that 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 was um, a, a bit of always a bit of a fiction because. The lawyers would only take in clients who could afford them, and and you know it's well known that if a lawyer doesn't want to take a case, they just quote a fee that's exorbitant or, or higher than they think the, the client can pay. The lawyers can also say, well, I, you know, I'd love to take your case, but I'm too busy now. So there are lots of ways to get around it. Um, so, but but it does have the benefit as as somewhat of a fiction of. Of arguably allowing defense counsel to say, "Look, I'm just taking this case because this guy came through the door, and you can't public shouldn't be judging me on um, on uh, taking on the case or being an advocate because 
I, ju I just take any, any cause no matter what. Whereas the argument can be made in Canada because lawyers have a choice that because they have a choice, they're making a de decision to uh, you know, represent Clifford Olson or something and they should be held morally accountable. But I, I, I think if one understands the, uh, the adversarial system and defense counsel's role in it in Canada, that the argument that the cab rank rule would, would make a difference uh, would stop the kind of complaints that we saw from Shannon Stubbs. I, I, don't, I don't think it really carries water. So I'd say, I, I think we're fine the way things are. Yeah, good question. That's it, shall we? Uh, oh, sorry. Thoughts on how you might balance your sense of personal evidence with the ethical responsibilities and justification of a lawyer from the system as a whole, or you so, so balancing your, your personal ethics with the ethics of your role within the system? Well, I, every lawyer has to be comfortable and able to do that. And, and so when, you, when a lawyer makes a decision to go into a particular area, I, I think they have to be comfortable with uh, from a personal perspective and their own ethics with what they're going to be doing as, as a lawyer. Uh, so, um, you know, it's fine for someone not to want to do criminal law because they, they feel it's, whatever the reason, they, they don't want to help people who are charged with crimes personally. That's, that's fine. There are some criminal lawyers who will not take on certain kinds of cases. Like I have a friend who who represents, uh, you know, the, the most notorious murderer, alleged murderer, sorry, alleged murderer in British Columbia, like, she will not do a uh, cruelty to animals case, ever. Like, so she makes that decision. That's the kind of case she can't do because she won't be able to do a good job. It's, it's, it's too upsetting for her. It goes against her, her personal beliefs. But, but ultimately, you've got to be able to be at peace yourself with what you believe in, um, as, as a person, as an individual, uh, before you make the decision to go into whatever kind of law it is. I mean, I think that's the only way you're going to feel good about what you're doing, that you're going to have a sense of, of self-worth. So, on the thought of self-worth, <laughs> we have a little book in here which may not be worth that much. <laughs> But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.